Okay, uh, welcome everyone to uh, um, an urgent uh, Zoom meeting uh, with Professor Amnon Reichman. Um, um, you are, we are hosting this of Unacceptable. Um, Unacceptable is a, a grassroots movement uh, organized around the world. Um, and uh, we are focusing on saving Israeli democracy. Uh, we are doing it, uh, uh, we are in protest every week, almost every week around the world. You can follow us on unacceptable.org. Um, and uh, I will not take much more time about that this weekend. For those of you who joined, uh, we have a, a, a protest, we are changing location in many, in many cities. So please uh, follow the updates. Uh, today, we are starting 11 a.m. There will be a protest in Los Angeles. So I assume they're not here, but if you're in Los Angeles and you want to make it, there three and then it continue over the weekend in new york uh houston boston um, and other cities so let's uh start um uh, i'm not, i'm going to try and make the best to uh, introduce you uh, and if i forget anything let me know so professor Amnon Raham Alden from hebrew university in jerusalem and llm from berkeley law um and uh, Toronto, his main focus of area is uh, around constitutional theories, theories of regulation, adjustment interpretation, comparative constitutional law and human rights and law and cyber. Uh, we met Professor Amnon Reichman uh, two weeks after Yariv Levin uh, introduced his judicial uh, uh, reform, which we now know it's a judicial coup. Um, this was a very good session to get everyone on board uh, on what's happening and understanding the terms because they're so complicated. Uh, we are going to touch a little bit about uh, what we call the uh, autocratic list um, and explain how by simple change of laws, uh, things can really go bad uh, in, the constitution, in the constitutional system. So without further ado, uh, uh, Amnon, uh, it's your stage. Thank you very much. Um, it, these are indeed urgent times. Um, uh, we have a lot on the agenda, so I will just immediately jump to it. What 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 are we going to talk about? Um, probably you're going to get more than you bargained for. We're going to talk a little bit about the context because it really matters. Then we're going to talk about the doctrine. You're going to get a condensed discussion of law because I think it's really important. We're getting into this stage where it's important that people understand the nitty gritty details of the law so they're informed because part of the context, the context is that uh, people are made to feel as if it's complicated and you can't really understand it. So we're going to, we're going to deal with the doctrine of unreasonableness. We're gonna situate it within the legal structure and we're gonna talk about types of unreasonableness. So, and at the end of the day, of course, there will be an exam and you'll have to pass the exam uh, in order to be able to protest. Uh, we'll have a, an exam at the end. Uh, and then, uh, of course, we're gonna uh, uh, dedicate some time to why it is important. Why it is so important, even though it's this kind of, uh, uh, obscure legal doctrine that nobody has really heard of before, but it's still very important. And then we're going to talk about the next steps uh, in conclusion. That's a lot. Let's start. Um, we are in the middle of a, an attempt to transform the Israeli regime. We must remember that. This is not some debate about this particular doctrine or that particular doctrine. It's an, we are in the midst of an attempt to transform the Israeli regime. The broader project here, and we know it because the other party told us so, and because we reviewed the list of about 150 bills submitted to the Knesset, and we read them. The idea of the big project is to switch tracks. It's to transform Israel away from a liberal democracy. Israel, hasn't been a fully liberal democracy ever. We have this little issue called the occupation. And up until 1966, as we all know, there was a military regime that controlled the Arabs in the Galilee and in other parts of Israel, but mainly the Galilee. Uh, but we were working towards a liberal democracy, at least as of the 
late 80s and early 90s. The idea was, this is where we're going to. And now we're switching tracks. Or the project of the current coalition is to have Israel switch tracks. What does it mean? Um, it means that actually we have three revolutions going on at the same time. The most fundamental, and we have to understand this, otherwise we don't understand the relationship of flow to all this. The most fundamental one is to change the policies and to change the culture and to change the language, to change how we speak about this. So the idea is that there are gonna be very, very uh, many and little, but in the aggregate, very profound changes to the way we do things in Israel. That's the cultural revolution. Um, it is gonna be supported by the budgetary revolution. This has already been enacted. If you follow the Israeli budget, the budget was already passed, you will see how a list of policy changes is already being supported by this budget. And of course it will be reflected in the law. The coalition wanted to start with the law for good reason because the law provides checks and balances against the budgetary and the cultural, that is policy and language uh, uh, transformations. Um, and this is why they're returning to it now. But this revolution has three pillars or, or, or three uh, engines working together. And we have to realize this. The idea is to change us into a more nationalistic and religion, re, uh, religious version of Israel. You know this, but it's important for me to state that. The idea is that there will be a preferential treatment to Jewish religious segments. The Haredi segments are already getting more than their fair share. We see this in the budget. We see this in some bills and some proposals relating to uh, uh, service or, or in, the, in the military or civil or national uh, uh, service. Um, orthodox values that deal with the equality for women, for the uh, gay and lesbian community, et cetera. This is in the works. Um, and of course the settlements in the land of Judea, we see what's happening now, what's going on now. We see the realities on the ground. We see the shift of competences, of authorities, of powers between this ministry to that ministry. We see how the plan is at the end of the day to annex uh, the sea territory. Um, the legal strategy is to release the government for, from checks and balances. The idea is that if we want to switch tracks, there are checks and balances in place that will make it difficult to switch tracks away from a liberal, liberal democracy. So we have to release, we have to unscrew, we have to untether those checks and balances um, that are in place in order to allow the coalition government um, to carry out this transformation. Um, and the tactic is shifted. The initial tactic was, let's do it all at once. Let's, let's stun them. Let's stun the opposition. The, the opposition was still kind of reeling from the, the, the loss in the election. Everybody was disorganized. Yariv Levin came and this is when we spoke because we saw this and we raised the alarm bells. We said, look, this is what they're doing. So the idea, their idea was let's put everything on board this, this very rapid train, load everything and rush this, this transformation through. Surprisingly, the Israeli civil society were proved to be resilient thus far with the help of you guys outside of Israel, with the help of making sure that things are known to decision makers outside of Israel, to the business community, to the diplomatic community, et cetera, et cetera. So instead of the shock and awe, then we have now one, one dismantling one piece at a time, dismantling one legislative piece at a time, the salami approach. Block by block, stone by stone, we're gonna take them out of this fortress until the fortress either collapse or is hollowed out. That's the idea. And we have to remember the uh, comparative perspective that uh, Ophir talked about. This is Kim Shikli. She's a, she uh, is a, a scholar that studies Hungary and other uh, illiberal democracies or, or the rise of other illiberal democracies. And she tells us, she tells us it's very important to this emergent illiberal authoritarian regime to maintain the legal apparatus, the legal facade, 
This is rule by law, law, not rule of law, and we're going to talk about the difference in a second. The idea is that they seek governability. They say, look, we have to govern all these checks and blocks, and they, they make the elites, the governing elites, uh, somehow circumvent the will of the people. We have to allow the will of the people to govern. We want to govern. Um, and of course, the guardians are to blame. We cannot govern because of them. So we have to untether. We have to remove the, the, those checks and balances. That's, that's the project. That's, that's the mission that, that is going on, has been going on in, in uh, Hungary, in Poland, in um, uh, Turkey, of course. So we have to realize that if this is going on, we cannot rely on the answer of, don't worry about it. You'll have elections in three years. If you don't like it, you can always uh, replace us. Why? Because this is just a facade. The, if the legal complex will be captured, we're not sure how the elections will be, will be handled. There are so many things, little things, that has happened in Poland and in Hungary and other places that make the elections less representative and give an, uh, an advantage to the governing coalition. We don't have to get in, we don't have time to get into that now. We can do it in another session, but this is why they wanted to first and foremost capture the courts and the legal advisors. They still do. It's still pending, as we know. We're six to eight hours away from this legislation. It's, we're on this cliff, but we were able to kind of hold this, put a block there. Uh, but in addition, there are transformation going on in the Israeli media at the moment. We can talk about this if you want. This changes public opinion. This is how you do it. This is how other authoritarian regimes do it. Again, under the disguise of there will be elections, don't worry about it. There are government handouts, talk about the budgets. People become dependent on the budgets. There are government contracts being handed out. This is how you buy your power. And if there are no checks and balances, effective checks and balances, this becomes much easier. Law enforcement is being captured. We will have election or, or the, the new chief of police will be, will be nominated relatively soon. Um, uh, regional chiefs are being nominated now. When you put your own people there and there are no checks and balances, or to the extent there won't be any checks and balances on that, this will be a form of capture. The election in three years won't help us. Uh, and of course, there are nominations to the civil service. You can appoint people there. And once you appoint people there, you can again steer the system away from a liberal democracy and towards serving your base and making sure that the elections down the road would not be fair elections. So this, this is how you, you do it. And Kim Shepley tells us so. This is how you do it one step at a time. This particular thing here, this little thing there, they're all tied together. And this is the context through which we should examine the current proposal. Um, so I'm going to say I'm going to say uh, one word about the current proposal. So the current proposal is actually an amendment to the basic law of the judiciary that says that the any court, including the Supreme Court, will not have the legal power to review any decision of the elected branches, anybody elected, under the cause of action of uh, unreasonableness. That's what's being proposed right now. In order to understand this seemingly innocuous amendment to the basic law, we have to understand the role or the place, unreasonableness or the unreasonable doctrine or cause of action, the role it plays in the general structure um, of, of Israeli public law. So let's talk about the general structure of the Israeli public law. Just three basic principles. The starting point, and this is the, where you're starting to get the lecture in public law. <laughs> like you can, you can, at the end of the day, as I said, you can, you can all qualify to say, yeah, we studied public law, we can become lawyers now. <laughs> You'll be cert you could be certified. So the starting point is that um, the substantive uh, principle of legality. What is the substantive principle of legality? The idea that, that the state may exercise power, power, legal power, any kind of power, only if it is authorized to do so in law. It must have a legal basis. But it's not enough that there will be a formal legal basis. 
it has to be in accordance with the, 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 the principle of a liberal democracy. That is, that the state uses its power only to promote justifiable governmental or public interest, and only if such exercise either promotes human rights or basic rights, or at least if, if infringement of rights is necessary to achieve the public interest, the infringement of rights is proportionate. This is extremely important. So the state, the state agencies are given power, but they must justify the use of the power. They must show that they have a legal basis and they must show that the use of legal power is done to advance, promote public interest and, if, and, and that the state has tried to do everything in, in, its, in its power to avoid um, infringement of rights. And if there was no other way, and some, many times there are no other way, at least the, the infringement was really necessary and no more than necessary. It didn't, it, the infringement of rights didn't exceed what was necessary. Okay, that's, these are the basic principles. Now that we know that, let's talk about the three main building blocks that um, transform those principles into actual doctrines. Okay, this is what it looks like. We must check that the state has legal competence. Legal competence, in Hebrew, we call it samchut. It means that you have a legal basis. This is the what we just said, the, the principle of, of the rule of law, the basic principle of legality. The state might, must show legal basis authorized by law. And that means that I'll, 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 in a second I'll run, I'll just say the, th the first three, the, the three building blocks now, and then I will, I will delve into each of them. Then the state has to show, demonstrate, or ensure to itself that it followed due process. And lastly, that it exercised discretion within the boundaries of law and, and reasonableness is in discretion. This is why it's highlighted. Let's say a few words about each of those three building blocks. So the state, when it exercises its power, its legal powers, must show that it has, as I said before, legal competence. So that the particular agency had subject matter jurisdiction, we call it, that is this particular ministry is really empowered to do those kind of things. This is why it was so important for Smotrich to get powers from the Ministry of, of Defense to deal with basically settlers' matters. These matters were within the competence of the Ministry of Defense. Now they moved to Smotrich, to the Ministry of uh, the, the other ministry that was, was uh, established within the Ministry of Defense in order to establish competence, legal competence, subject matter jurisdiction. Then you have to make sure that the institution that is exercising the legal power and the people within the institution are authorized in law. I don't have time to get into that. And then you have to show time and space. You have to show that they can exercise in the particular territory and during the particular temporal time slot. That's legal competence, very important. We don't have time to get into that. Due process, also very important. The state must exercise or any state agency must have adequate factual basis before it uses its legal power. It must do its best to mitigate any conflict of interests. It must provide effective and fair hearing. And it must make a timely decision. These are called sometimes principles of natural justice. Um, that is that when the state exercises its law making power or its adjudicative power, it must comply with those due process principles. I'm pausing here. You may ask, is there a law for this? Well, in most jurisdiction there is. In Israel, only this issue of timely decision is actually in a statute, in a Knesset statute. All the rest of it, all of this is case law. The Israeli judiciary, primarily the Supreme Court, developed this uh, as part of the Israeli case law. This is why it's so unusual that the uh, Knesset now wants to intervene. I'll show you exactly where in, 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 the, in, the, in a discretionary doctrine, in doctrine governing discretion, without 
first legislating an entire code for the exercise of state power. There were proposals, they were not advanced. Now, let's continue and examine the doctrines that apply to governmental discretion. The first one is that the government may only take into account relevant considerations. It cannot rely or take into account irrelevant considerations. It must take all relevant consideration. If the government failed to take a relevant consideration into account, it's a problem. The court may tell it, hey, you neglected this. Now, particularly of importance, when rights are infringed or when the government comes to a conclusion that it must infringe a right in order to promote the public interest, and it happens, could be national security, could be public peace, law and order, all kinds of good causes for which we have a government, which, for which we have a state. And sometimes rights have to be infringed. The government must ensure that it search for alternatives that may infringe less, and there aren't any. And in any event, that it went through this process of balancing, right? That it chose the option that infringes the least on rights in order to achieve the governmental, the legitimate governmental goal. We call it necessary and proportionate. Um, there are other terms for that, that other, uh, there are other formula for uh, balancing. Um, if we had time, we could have delved into that. This is very important. It includes all the list of liberties the court developed in Israel. The, uh, the a list of liberties, not written anywhere, judge-made law, freedom of expression, uh, of course, freedom of conscience, freedom of movement, many more, and also equality. This applies also to equality, of course. And here, now, what happens if you don't have, what happens if you don't have a particular right that is infringed, or you cannot demonstrate a rights infringement? Still, the government is under an obligation to act reasonably. If you have a private interest that is not a right, it's not a protected right, or even a public interest that is infringed, the government must ensure that it acts reasonably. Let's say a few words about this reasonable. What does this reasonable mean? It sounds so subjective. What is this reason business? How do we know? It's actually much more structured than, than one may think. Um, here here, how, here how, is how it goes. We reach reasonableness only as a residual doctrine, only after we looked at the competence and the factual basis and the due process and all the relevant consideration and only relevant consideration. And, and, and now we go, got to this place where we have to balance. So let's say there are three considerations, three relevant considerations. The, the, the state must, or the relevant agency must take into account. Consideration Aleph, I, should, I could have used Greek letters, but I said, why not Hebrew? Consideration Aleph, consideration Bet, and consideration, oh, that's another Bet, but it's a different kind of Bet. It's a different color of a Bet, okay. These are the considerations that the state must consider. Now, the question is what kind of weight, what weight, which weight should each consideration be given? This establishes the margin of reasonableness. Okay, let's take a look. This is the uh, margin of reasonableness here. Um, the, the state can reach decision A. The state can also reach decisions B, C, and D within the margin of reasonableness. In each of those, different weight is allocated to each of the relevant considerations. Um, and it's okay. It can be a decision A, it can be, of course, very different decisions, extremely different decisions. But that is okay. The court will not intervene. This is within the purview of the state to decide. But 
What happens if the state makes decision one? What make, happens if it makes decision two? Or what happens if it makes, if it takes this decision over there? This decision will be patently unreasonable. Why? Because the court will look at this and will say, I cannot see any way that this decision could have been reached unless you've given unreasonable weight to at least one consideration. You were supposed to give, to take those considerations into account. You said you did. But if you take these considerations into account, this decision just, just doesn't follow. You cannot, it's inconceivable that these decisions, it's patently unreasonable, extremely unreasonable, if you reach this decision based upon those considerations. And this is when the court will intervene. Okay, that's, that's the structure of the doctrine. It's beyond, not only beyond the margin of reasonableness, because this decision is beyond the margin. It has to be considerably beyond, significantly beyond the margin of reasonableness. So you look at the decision and the exercise of power, and you say, as I reverse engineer it back to the consideration, you should have, you should have, you said you did. There is a mismatch. I cannot connect this. It just doesn't, doesn't make sense. Somehow you have misused your very basic duty, fiduciary duty to act in order to promote public interest and infringe on rights no more than necessary, somehow you, there was some error there. And it, might, it is my role as a court to say, reconsider. Let's talk about some examples, okay? Let's, let's see how, how it works uh, on the ground. This will be invalidated by, by the court. Okay, so let's see, let's, let's give this stuff some context. Um, funding and allocation decisions. Let's see an example. So the, the, this doctrine, the, the roots of the doctrine are basically common law roots in, in, in Britain. There, there are British cases, there's a famous British case where the, the court, the British court said it's patently unreasonable to do something. Um, in, in the particular case, it, it had to do with what children at the age of 15 were allowed or not allowed to do. It doesn't matter here. I can give you the reference if you're interested and study some British law. I understand that now in the United States, you have to know British law, but from the 16th century. So <laughs> I'm sorry about that. This is more modern. As a side note, it's very interesting to uh, think from the outside what exactly was the uh, idea behind the, the war of independence against the British if British 16th century law still applies in the United States, but that's, that's, a, different, uh, that's a different question. Uh, in Israel, um, this doctrine was adopted from the common law, but then it was revised in the 80s. This formula that I, that I just shared with you was revived in the 80s in a famous case that dealt with a, with a public tender. In that particular case, the, the, the state decided to, to issue a public tender and to do something with who's gonna, which private entity is gonna help out the broadcasting authority in dealing with commercial. The broadcasting authority didn't know how to, how to do all the uh, uh, pricing and placement of ads, commercials on the radio. And it said, okay, I'm gonna do a public tender. I'm gonna have a private entity that will deal with it. I'm, I'm a broadcasting agency. I don't want to deal with all these issues of commercial. The question though was whether the, the contract should be for 10 years. So there was a competitor and a competitor said, why are you gonna sign a contract with them for 10 years? That's a very long time. And you know, maybe I should be considered two after five years, after six years, it's very long. Especially if uh, because, uh, there was no tender, the state decided against the tender, the state decided to continue with the previous entity that provided this service. Um, now, by the way, now it would, the state would be obligated to have a public tender. But under the law, as it was in the 80s, there was no obligation for a public tender. The state decided to continue with the contract and for 10 years. And then Justice Aaron Barak said, you know what? It's actually not an easy question. The state has a, a responsibility to act for the promotion of 
of, of the welfare of everybody, I understand why it's easier for the state to, it's more comfortable, convenient to work with those it already knows, but it raises concerns. Uh, perhaps there might be some corruption here, who knows, we don't really know. But in any event, the court came to the conclusion that it's not patently unreasonable for 10 years. The court said, you know, if it's up to me, maybe I would have said only six or five years, but I'm not running the show. The government is running the show. It's not my role to replace the government. I defer. They have a margin of reasonableness. It's not patently outside. If it would have been for 20 years, I would have maybe intervened. That's the attitude. The court said, I'm here to observe, but I'm going to defer if I can. However, there were cases in which on, on, on funding issues, the court did intervene. A very famous case is about funding some um, protective or armaments in, in, in the Sderot school in order to, to generate a, a, a protected spaces like shelters. Um, the government decided that it, it's, it's not worth it for them to fortify with concrete the classes of some, in some schools in Sderot, basically telling the kids, you know, you have to run, you have 15 seconds, whenever you hear the siren, you have 15 seconds to run to, to some public shelter. And this has been going on for about nine years, or between eight to 10 years, something like that. Constantly, there, was, there were attacks on the road from Gaza, and the, the state said, it's not worth it for me. Why? Because these rockets are very inaccurate. The chances that they will actually kill somebody are not that big. Uh, 15 seconds, can make it, you know, if you get you, 60 seconds, you can run. Um, and I don't want to spend the money. At a certain point, the court said, look, it's unreasonable. Why is it unreasonable? It's unreasonable because the we're not intervening in your funding or allocation decisions, but here in this particular case, the statute demands that people send their kids to school. They have an obligation to do so. And because they have an obligation to send their kids to school, you, Ministry of Education and Finance Minister, have an obligation to make sure that they're reasonably prote protected in that school. And having them run for 15 seconds or 30 seconds is unreasonable. And we know, the court said, that if something like that would have happened in Tel Aviv, there would be a response, not in five years or six years, in three months, something would have done, or would have been done to stop this. Similarly, in Jerusalem, the municipality said, we're gonna build a school right next to a very, right next to a very polluting plant, some chemicals or some metals or something. Why? Because it's easier for us. The court said, yeah, yeah, but there are kids there. And they have a duty to be there. They can't just choose not to be there. It's unreasonable. In another case, the government said, well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna stop funding immediately without giving any, any notice. Some programs are funded and the next day they're gonna be defunded. The court said, but, but you have fiduciary duty to your, to your people. There's an interest of reliance. They don't have a right to receive the, the, the funds. You, can, you, the government, you can change it. There's no right, but there is an interest of reliance. Citizens rely on you, the government. If you want to change, give some notice so people can adjust, so they can act accordingly. So these are, these are examples of funding and allocation decisions. By the way, most of the most of the laws about public tenders and, 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 and monies are derived from the idea of reasonableness. For example, when a tenders committee sits and has to decide which way to accord to which 
to which segment within the public tender, at the end of the day, it has to be reasonable. The court will give a, a wide margin of reasonableness, but at the end of the day, what do we know? We know that the that this committee, the tenders committee, cannot re, cannot engineer the tender such that it's it's understood that maybe only one person will be able to get or one entity will be able to win the tender because in an unreasonable manner, some weights were assigned to some issues and only, only that particular entity will qualify. At the end of the idea, we see, at the end of the day, what do we see here? It's an anti-corruption mechanism, right? Whenever money is on the table and allocation and funds are on the table, the state A want to make sure that, the, that corruption is handled and B, it wants to make sure and I will say, I will talk to it more in a second, that the state, that we, sorry, that we, the public is protected against what, what we call in the academia an institutional bias. What is this institutional bias building, business? And it's very important. Whenever we have the government making decisions, there is an agency problem. We want the government to make a decision, but we realize that there are pressures and forces on a govern, uh, on any government, even if this government is a great government. Let me give you an example. The center periphery bias. If you have to decide where to build a hospital, in the center or in the periphery, you will build the hospital in the center. Why? Because it serves more people. So for any shekel or dollar you invest, you will be able to serve more people. What does it mean? It means that there will be a discrepancy in the, in the level of medical services between the center and the periphery. Will the court intervene? Not necessarily. But if there's a duty, a legal duty somewhere, such as this the road case, there's a legal duty to send your kids, then the court will say, enough. I have to counter this, this institutional bias. There is an institutional bias not to count the kids, the kids of Sderot as you would count the kids of Tel Aviv. Now, usually the court will say, okay, politics will take care of it. But if you have a legal duty infused there, the court will say, that's the limit. It's unreasonable if you don't provide uh, the kids of Sderot also with something fair because we cannot, we cannot, we cannot fully rely on the, on the uh, political process in such cases because of uh, because of this uh, uh, bias, this, the road people just don't have enough uh, enough uh, power in the Knesset compared to the people of Tel Aviv, just because they're more in Tel Aviv than in, than in Sderot. That's the problem of cent center and periphery bias. Um, the same goes for policy changes. The, the state wants to have the ability to change policies immediately, especially if there are um, only segments, small segments of the population that will be impacted by such abrupt changes. They won't be able to then punish the, the civil service, the civil servants who made the decision in the elections because the elections will be on something else. And in any event, these, these people are not elected uh, and, and the politicians, even if it was mandated by politicians, there's so many other issues on the agenda that it's very difficult to correct this. And, and, and there is, an institutional bias for the state to say, I want to, to be agile, I want to respond immediately and I can save money. I'm doing it not because of corruption, I'm, I'm doing it to save money, but the court says, okay, okay. At the end of the day, we have to correct this institutional bias that you are overemphasizing agility and governability uh, at the expense of the interest of reliance. Most importantly is the case of appointments. Appointments is perhaps a major or a major site for the application of the doctrine of reasonableness. In Israeli law, there are no statutory or very few statutory requirements for governmental positions. There's a, there's a wide discretion for the appointed appointing powers of the powers of, or the powers of appointment. So um, let's think of institutional bias. Suppose I am the Ministry of Housing. I never wanted to be a politician, but let's assume that's my punishment for this for this uh, morning, your morning or afternoon in the East Coast. 
Um, and I get to be the Ministry of uh, Housing. And I need to get things done quickly. And I have two options. I can appoint somebody who's really loyal to me and not so much to the rule of law, or I could appoint somebody who's loyal to me, but more loyal to the rule of law. Whom will I choose? There is an institutional bias. I will choose the person loyal to me over the rule of law, over his loyalty to the rule of law. This is the case of Ginosau. I don't know how many of you remember the 3000 affair, the 300 affair, what, what is called Parashat Kav Shloshmot or 300 line bus line affair, where um, there was a terror attack. The special forces, um, the special forces intervened and released the hostages. And they said that uh, the two terrorists were killed during the military operation. It turns out that they didn't die during the military operation. How do we know this? Because there's a famous photograph that one of the one of the news uh, papers uh, photographer took, and you see a guy bl blindfolded going uh, go going down from the bus. Okay, so there was a commission of inquiry appointed to see how come this terrorist found his death. I mean, he looked for it and then he found his death. Uh, what happened? Who killed him? Okay. In that commission, uh, inquiry, uh, in this inquiry commission, sat the representative of the General Security Service, Mr. Genossar. It turns out that Mr. Genossar leaked all the classified, uh, he was a member of the commission of inquiry. He leaked all the classified information to the general security service. So the general security service could falsify some evidence in order to make it look like a general had ordered the killing, but not conclusively. So he won't be actually indicted, but there will be some kind of suspicions, but not, but not, um, concrete enough, and this is how it won't be known that the General Security Service people actually killed those two terrorists. It, so that it was an instruction of the head of the, of the General Security Service. Turns out that this Genosal totally lied. Now he actually completely corrupted this, this legal process of inquiry. Arik Sharon, after several years, as the Ministry of, Minister of Housing, wanted to appoint him as the Director General of the Ministry of Housing. And the court said, hey, if you want to do that, you have the power of appointing, and there is a margin of appreciation, uh, of, of reasonableness. And you said that you took into consideration the fact that he, he lied and everything. Now, he got pardoned by the president. All the general security service person got pardoned by that. So they didn't even they didn't even stand trial, let alone serve time in jail. They were just pardoned by the by the president for national security reasons. So the, the court said, okay, you said that you took into consideration all the relevant considerations. But if you want to appoint Kinasar, you have to show that he has some exceptional skills or qualifications that would counterbalance his slight problems with the rule of law. Are there any? Well, you haven't shown, you haven't demonstrated any other than you like working with him. And he has experience, but others have similar experiences. So the court said, you can't use your power of appointments in such a way. And the court was absolutely right. Why? Because there is an institutional bias to, to appoint people that are loyal to you uh, and they can actually do the work, but they're loyal to you and not to the rule of law. And if the reasonable doctrine or unreasonable doctrine uh, will, will, um, will be abolished, as this basic law suggests, it means that the government will have almost unlimited power to appoint anybody. Now, technically speaking, the, they want to abolish the reasonable doctrine only for the elected, but under Israeli law, the government can, um, can take legal powers from any civil service and use the legal powers itself. And therefore there will be immunity for basically all appointments. 
Dairy is a similar case. Dairy, the, the, uh, if you want, under the Q&A, we can talk about the dairy. Uh, he was appointed by Rabin um, uh, to be the interior minister, and then, and then he was indicted, and the court told uh, Rabin, the prime minister, it's unreasonable that you don't that you don't fire the minister now that he was indicted because the minister under Israeli law has legislative power he issues bylaws by the way a director general also has a legal power he issues what we call Jose Mancal, which is which are the rules of the particular ministry and you can't have people um, that, that have been indicted or people that have problems with the rule of law using that kind of legal power so the entire system or, or the entire ethics of the Israeli civil service relies on this doc doctrine of reasonableness. This is why it is so important, and this is why it is coveted now by the government, because once you release this check, you can put your own people without any problem. And once these people are, are loyal to you more than to the rule of law, it's similar to, to capturing uh, the, the Judicial Appointments Committee, but on a small scale, but still very, very important. And then there is procedural um, procedural reasonability. Uh, the idea here is recall this competence, factual basis, relevant consideration, all the due process. There is an element of reasonableness in all of them. What is a timely decision? Well, it, reasonably timely. What about the factual basis? Oh, it has to be reasonably you have to have a reasonable factual basis. All of these elements have a, a, an element of reasonableness. And therefore, there is a doctrine, or there is a, a version of the doctrine that talks about procedural reasonableness. Um, the, the current proposal doesn't distinguish between substantive and procedural. And it doesn't distinguish between another very important uh, question, whether we're talking about grand policy decisions in which the court usually provides very wide margin of reasonableness, or concrete and particular decisions in which the court usually looks much closer at a particular decision. Um, there is also decisions, interestingly, concerning the application of prosecutorial discretion. A couple of words about these. The doctrine of reasonableness also applies to those who exercise prosecutorial powers. So if the Attorney General of Israel decides not to press charges, that is subject to judicial review because also the Attorney General, the Attorney General may also be captured. If Tel Aviv, the municipality, has legal power to decide whom to prosecute, and it has laws, Tel Aviv, has laws that prevent the operation of some businesses on Shabbat. And what does the, state, uh, the city of Tel Aviv does? It issue fines, 600, 700 shekels fines, and it uses them basically as taxes because everybody knows that there will be some, some city, city person will come, um, some enforced, city enforcement person will come, will issue you a fine, you'll pay the 600, 700 shekels, and you will keep working on Shabbat. And then the court said, there's a rule of law problem. Decide. If you're just using it as a city tax, as a form of city tax, you're unauthorized to do this. It's unreasonable. If you want um, to allow people to work on Shabbat, change the municipal law. But you cannot have it both ways. And the city of Tel Aviv said, OK, we will revisit the municipal laws and we'll, we'll decide which entity will be open what. But we'll, 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 just, we'll just play by the rules rather than have this charade of everybody violating the rule and getting fines and we use it as a, as a state tax. So we see that at the end of the day, the doctrine of reasonableness cuts both ways. It cuts to, towards the left and towards the right and religious and non-religious, it plays, it's not, it's not, it doesn't, it's not a political doctrine in that sense. It's a rule of law doctrine. Why it's so important, we talked a little bit about this. Um, if we release this doctrine, we release a very important check on discretion. We basically tell the state, you are relieved from your duty 
So act reasonably. We tell the government because the elected branches, because we talk about the elected branches, you are relieved from your duty to act reasonably because you are elected. Now that's wrong. Everybody has to act as part of its fiduciary duty to for the promotion of the public interest and the protection of human rights. On the ground, we often don't know whether irrelevant considerations were actually considered and what was the factual basis. And if we remove this doctrine without, without any compensating mechanism, um, the state can say yes. We the state can say yes. We considered everything, and actually, um, all the other requirements of Israeli public law will basically be circumvented, because we, it's very difficult to know what what actually goes on behind closed doors, sometimes in the government. Um, there's also an element of principle here, because as we know, as, as we know, in Israel, everything is judgment law. And once the, the, the legislature decides to relieve the coalition from a duty, it can, the same way it's doing to reasonable nas, now, can go one by one to each of those doctrine and either abolish it or make it um, less biting. In conclusion, the very first thing we need to do if, 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 is if we want to touch reasonableness, we can replace it with another doctrine. But we have to make sure that there is another doctrine that does this similar job. If we want to uh, replace it, we have to make sure, for example, that we can know exactly what happens in any governmental decision. What was the factual basis? Who said what to whom? What were the actual considerations considered? All that. That will help. That is not being considered. Only if we know what will be the next stage. Now they're talking about reasonableness. But as we know, Kim Shepley told us, this is not just this. There's going to be other parts coming. Only if we know the entire picture. Only if it's part of a, a grand compromise or a grand deal can we seriously discuss this. Only if it's done as we say, as we say, with the agreement of a multi-party, because you don't make such changes in a basic law without, without broad agreement. And of course, we have to make sure that it will apply to the next government, because this particular government will release uh, a check on itself and then go appoint some people and then go do th some things that will change our ability to have uh, meaningful elections in three years, that's very worrisome. We need to act beyond the veil of, of ignorance and all these changes, if we really want them, will have to apply only after the subsequent elections. Truth be told, there is no really good reason why the doctrine of unreasonableness should be amended in the way they wish to amend it. And this is worrisome and this is why I'm here. Thank you for your uh, patience with me. That was, I know, kind of heavy. Uh, a lot of legal jargon, a lot of case law. Um, and I was light because there's a lot of case law. I just was, right? now, now perhaps is the time. Uh, Ophir, um, if you want thank to. You, uh, um, um, we, I mean, thank you for. Thank you for taking the time and explaining to us. I, I want to, uh, there, is, there is actually a good question in, in the chat and then I want to add another question. So is, I mean, like part, part of what we uh, saw in the first uh, blitz of uh, laws is that there could have been a constitutional crisis if, for example, the government is deciding to change the law and the, gov and the Supreme Court is saying, no, it's, it's not uh, applicable. Uh, it's, um, it is changing the doctrine um, could uh, create a constitutional uh, crisis by the, by uh, uh, this, when the Supreme Court is saying like this is not lawful. Um, well, that's a challenge. Why? Because unlike the capture of the uh, judicial appointment committee where it was patently unconstitutional. Here, um, the court will have to invalidate a basic law. They want to do it in the basic law. 
Now, the court could, could go, I think, as far as saying, well, it will apply only after, for, after the subsequent Knesset or the following Knesset. But to fully invalidate this, my, my understanding of Israeli public law is that it doesn't, precisely because they want, the, it's not shock and awe. It's one little clog at a time, one little stone at a time, an important stone but not at the level of the Judicial Appointment Committee. Yeah. For, for the court to say it's unconstitutional and we're gonna invalidate the basic law for that, unlikely. However, the court will be put, be put in, a very, in a very precarious place. Why? Because the court will be told not to consider unreasonableness at all against the elected uh, government, then the court will say, but up until now, I had the duty to develop public law doctrines. Should I develop now a doctrine that comp to compensate the abolition of the reasonableness? Or am I now also being precluded for finding an alternative that will achieve a way to counter the institutional bias? What should I do with this? I want to be a loyal, a loyal uh, agent to the constitutional structure. So the court will be really kind of in, in, in a difficult position. And this is a good reason why we should uh, make sure that um, if we touch this doctrine, we only touch it in a, in, a, in a statutory reform that specifically says to the court, you know, you have a duty to protect the underlying principles of Israeli public law. Thank you. Um, so I, I want to uh, I want to take much more time. I mean, there is. I mean, we, let's take another ten minutes. Um, this is. Uh, um, um, I, I mean, I, I want to take a couple of examples of uh, why we are here. I mean, so first of all, we we are here because the government and actually the uh, um, the the Yariv Levine was saying like, oh yeah, we didn't. We we actually meant to take uh, checks and balances by the first blitz. So we know that they have a goal to take more power. And so it's not happening. This is not a change of law that's happening in, in a vacuum, right? So that's one. The second one is we are hearing uh, ministers uh, like uh, Shlomo Kari and others talking about that the general attorney is actually interfering, right? So, so by, by changing, we, we, we cannot fire Gali Barav Miara right now, but if we change the doctrine, uh, we could actually remove her from the duty and point another one. So, so this, this doctrine is actually enabling the government to, to make many changes that they, that they wanted to do in, back in January, but in a different way. Um, another another uh, uh, appointment, another, another reason that they want to change this doctrine, I assume, is there was, a, there was a goal to make a law that will make them appointing general attorneys to each minister, right? It will be... Um, uh, how do you say it? Like it, it will actually they they will be appointed to do on behalf of the minister, not on behalf of the law, right? And now, well, now it makes a sense to that they can change it by by, by the un, uh, unreasonableness doctrine. They can go and change it. So th those changes are not happening in a vacuum. In the, 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 it seems like the salami uh, 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 way that they that they uh, um, import. Um, is actually by the book of uh, changing, I mean, creating another law that, again, it takes a professor to explain to us, right? It sounds reasonable, um, but to take power uh, that could actually drive us to, uh, um, to have an election next, uh, next cycle, but an election that will be uh, unfair and unbalanced. Uh, yes, there will be an election. Um, I agree with you, Ophir. I think that's a very valid point, a very good point. As, as Kim Shepley tells us, these little things are tied to each other. And as soon as you remove one check, it will affect other checks. And this is how you capture, this is how you co-opt the system, this is how you hollow it out from its liberal, liberal commitments. And this is why we're here. Absolutely. Yep. And this is why we should keep telling this to our friends in, in the United States and in the Senate and in other places that look, this is a form of capture. It's a form and of again, capture. They're, 
it's a form of culture. And they're doing it unilaterally. They're still not getting the point that you, when you make changes to the Israeli constitutional structure, you have to do it in a multi -party, through a multi-party process, not just because you happen to have 64 members and then you take the system and run with it. Yeah, and, and so just to give uh, uh, our audience also a sense, I mean, like the session of the Knesset that we are dealing with right now is have more, four more weeks, right? Mm -hmm. So we have to be alert and, uh, and stay vigilant um, and, and fight wherever we can. So what we can do, uh, uh, Tali is asking, I mean, like we can, again, join the movement, stay up to date, communicate it to your synagogues, communicate it to your rabbis, to your community leaders, uh, join the rallies again. I mean, like I'll just repeat what I what I remember from my head. Uh, we are meeting in San Francisco at 3 p.m. Uh, to uh, on New York. Uh, we are there. There is a rally on Sunday at 12 uh, Eastern time. There is a rally at uh, um, in um, uh, Washington D.C. There is a rally in Houston. Again, join the, uh, the through the link and maybe uh, Neri can put the unacceptable link on the chat. Um, and, and stay up to date. But most importantly, I mean, assume that this government has already showed their main goal to take extra power, remove checks and balances under so many excuses, right? But it's that's their uh, goal. Um, Tali is mentioning that they are protesting in Philadelphia three times a week uh, in front of Kohelet and other places. Join everywhere you can. This is super, super important. Uh, and we have four weeks to fight. Again, in Israel, they created what they call Kaplan Force, right? Uh, almost 150,000 people on WhatsApp messages ready for call. Again, we don't have it here. Uh, we have the Unacceptable Global Group. We have an, a sister uh, uh, organization in Europe, uh, mostly uh, called Defending Israeli Democracy. There is many ways to stay in touch, um, please uh, communicate it forward. We will upload the... The video and share it uh, to everyone who uh, signed up and uh, couldn't. There is also on Facebook uh, link. Uh, Amnon, any other closing remarks before we uh, let people go and, and, and send the message out? Stay vigilant. We were able to block the uh, big, big uh, capture of the Judicial Appointment Committee. We should be able to continue to do that. We're not going to let go in Israel. Um, inform politi US politicians as well that this is so important. Um, and together we stand, you know, that's that's the important message. Thank you very much. And thank you, Neri, for co-hosting with me. Um, again, uh, very uh, uh, um, important Zoom call. We are going to share it uh, globally um, and uh, stay in touch. Um, and those of you in San Francisco, 3 at 3 p.m. today. Bye. Have a good day. Bye-bye. Shabbat shalom. Shabbat shalom, everyone. Bye-bye.